I am delighted to have such a fascinating panel on the stage with me this morning. We have four museum directors working in very different contexts with a fascinating range of professional expertise and experience, and they certainly demonstrate the truth that there's no one path into museum directorship. We have an hour together this morning. Um, we ha I have some questions. We've had some questions through Twitter. Um, I, I'm not going to be monitoring Twitter during the session, so if you have any other questions, uh, we have some microphones posed, placed around the room, so when the moment comes, um, I'd be fascinated to have some contributions from the floor. Um, so I'll just introduce you briefly to the panel. On my right is David Mann. He, David is director of the Scottish Maritime Museum, where he's been in post for four years, but he was previously operations manager for ten years. Um, the Scottish Maritime Museum has got two locations, one down on the Ayrshire coast and another just to the west of Glasgow. And David's background is in the leisure industry before he came into museums. Um, Tonya Nelson is director of UCL Museums, where she's been in charge since 2014. And before that, she was manager of the Petrie Museum, UCL Museum Service, including the Petrie, the um, UCL Art Museum, and the Grant Museum of Zoology. So, um, Tonya had a background before in governance and planning at the London Transport Museum. And before that was a management consultant and a corporate lawyer and has a master's in, fi in history of art. So <laughs> reading Tonya's CV was, uh, was, uh, encourages me to up my game, I would say. <laughs> to my left, we have Catherine Thompson, who is chief executive at National Museums Northern Ireland, where she's been since March this year. So with eight months in service, Catherine is keen for us to understand that she's coming at this with a fresh pair of eyes. Catherine's background is in the Northern Ireland Tourist Board, as well as NHS Glasgow and in Accountancy. So again, a diverse background. And Catherine now manages the three museums that, take, that form the National Museum of Northern Ireland. And on my far left is Gordon Rintoul, uh, Director of National Museum of Scotland since 2002. Um, Gordon has a background opening new museum projects and museum developments in Bradford, Merseyside, Sheffield, and a sequence of major capital projects at National Museum of Scotland in the last 10 to 15 years. In fact, it'd be hard to argue that, um, okay, here's the joke, anyone has spent more of the lottery fund's money than Gordon in recent <laughs> years. Um, however, he has a, a very impressive background uh, in the academic world as well, uh, with a background in science and technology. And Gordon uh, runs the two museums in Edinburgh, as well as the Museum of Flight to the east of Edinburgh, and the uh, Museum of Rural Life here south of Glasgow. So I hope you agree our panel have got a really interesting range of experience. They're currently working in very diverse parts of the museum sector. So I hope there's, if we don't address questions relevant to your own organisation, that you bring them yourself. So um, I'm going to start with a question that comes from um, Twitter, from Sam Elliott from Bolton. And she basically says, is it the best of times or the worst of times? Is it all bleak from here or in, on in? Or is the challenge of working differently positive? How do you feel about the future, Gordon? Well, interesting question. I, I mean, I would say that in my whole career in museums, which is about 30 odd years or something now, there's actually never been a time when things have been static uh, and things have been straightforward. There's always been challenges. Uh, I, think, I think now you could say on one hand, yeah, more challenges, what's different, but I think it's the scale, scale of challenges actually now for some, some parts of the sector and definitely some parts of the, the, the UK. I think those of you who are based in who are based in England know only too well uh, the the impact there of, of government cutbacks, impact on local authorities and museum closures, reduction of staff. But I think the same thing is happening, in, perhaps in a quieter way in other parts of the country as well, including Scotland, with a loss of expertise around museums. I mean, that's the, there's been slow decline, but I think we're seeing an increasing pace of that of that that decline in expertise. And in terms of Brexit, I mean, how are you <coughs> feeling? How are you feeling that and anticipating that? Because I can imagine that's virtually impossible to plan for. It's impossible to keep up with how it develops in the news. But actually, as your as a director of a museum service, how are you managing that? Well, I think I think the challenge is the uncertainty. No, no one knows the answers. We might all have our own personal views on what should happen, what shouldn't happen. But really, none of us have got a clue what might happen at the end of the day, particularly after last last week's uh, court court case and out, out, outcome. <laughs> Certainly when, uh, when the, the vote came in unexpectedly for Brexit, uh, we actually checked how many of our staff were from the rest of the EU and we were absolutely really surprised, if not amazed, to find that 10% of our entire employees are from the rest of the EU. That crept up over, 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 over a, a number of years and of course they were saying, what's going to happen to us? And of course we, we don't know the answer. 
So I think that uncertainty is a real issue for certainly any employees any of us got from elsewhere in the, in the EU. It's also a financial issue as well. Um, any, anyone who's, who's been recipient of EU grants must be wondering, is that going to continue? Um, but also there's a big, a big hit which is going to, is going to affect all, all of us through, through the ex exchange rate. I mean, sterling took a nosedive, 20% less again, against the euro. Uh, given that five out of the six or seven display case manufacturers in Europe are actually in the eurozone, and one, maybe two in, in the UK, any big capital projects, it's going to cost you more for your display cases in the, in the years to come. So there's all sorts of impacts I think are only now emerging. So, Catherine, I yes. know that you're new to the sector, but... Brand new. <laughs> <laughs> Highly intimidated to be in front of so many people that have so much experience in the sector, but yes. But your background in tourism must also give you an understanding of how some of these things are going to impact on us, how Brexit will impact, I mean, particularly in Northern Ireland, you're in a particularly potentially well, fragile situation. Uh, yes, and I suppose listening to some of the debate around uh, Brexit, particularly um, in the rest of the UK, probably... It, it, the issues are not as extreme for us in Northern Ireland, but from a tourism perspective, um, we only have 25% visitors to our sites from outside of Northern Ireland. So I think looking forward, Northern Ireland lags behind in terms of tourism. It lags behind in terms of its economy already. So will Brexit have a disproportionate effect for us? And what impact will that have on future projections around tourism? Because we would be wanting to see visitor numbers grow, which would then, obviously, we would like to get our share of that through the museums, which would help the sustainability of our model in the future. Thank you. But you did ask the question, is it the best of times or the worst of I times? Did. I have to say it's the best of times because I'm brand new and I would like to think that <laughs> <laughs> this is a fantastic sector to work in and um, certainly I do see many challenges, but it is really exciting So, uh, and there's lots of opportunity. Thank you. David, how are you feeling? Best of times or worst of times? I think it's been worse. Uh, and I think uh, in 2008, I think in Scotland, we had quite a a sharp impact and I think a lot of the the cuts and the effect the financial effect was was felt then and I think it's been getting slowly better as, as Gordon says that the, the problem we have now is the uncertainty what's Brexit going to do how is it going to impact us we've got a short-term bounce in visitors uh, short-term international gain while the, the pounds is low but that as Gordon says that's going to be countered in years to come when we're paying more for virtually everything that we put into the museum so there are pluses and negatives on both sides I think museums and independent museums have been pretty resilient over the last uh, 10 years and I think they'll continue to be pretty resilient. It just depends if we go out of Brexit, if we lose European funding and big projects start looking uh, more inward for funding and affecting the funding that would have been picked up with the independent sector, then we're going to have a crisis in funding and it may roll on from there. So it is very uncertain, uh, but I think it's probably been worse in Scotland for independent museums and smaller museums. Uh, but it may get worse again. And both of your museums are in areas of yeah, multiple, multiple, multiple deprivation. deprivation. Yes, I mean, yes uh, which in the past would have uh, enabled us to access European funding, ESF funding, to do different projects, to work with local authorities and other museums, uh, and that's not going to be there, and there's no clear picture of who's going to fund that kind of work. Uh -huh. Tonya, how are things looking for you? Best of times or worst of times? University sector, obviously, really yes, under threat. Yes, yes, I mean, I have to say, it, you know, in the past couple of months since the Brexit vote. Um, I've lost two members of staff to, to Glasgow and to uh, Ireland. Um, and, you know, working with university researchers, we've had lots of fallout in terms of the research that we're doing around exhibitions where researchers have gone and left due to the decision for Brexit. So there has been a sort of short-term impact, but my general perspective is that it's actually the best of times because I do think this is a particular moment when we as museums can kind of change our perspective and be there as uh, a, a place where people can um, come for social cohesion, where we can start to think about um, the issues that are sort of dividing us as, as a country, as, as a place in the United States and, and, and uh, here, um, and start to think about those issues of immigration, of, of globalization, and use our collections and use the history that we know to really be a force for kind of rethinking things and figuring out where all this divisiveness is coming from. So I do think it's a particular moment if we seize it um, that could be really good for museums. So you think the just general disconnect, the cultural kind of fragility is actually opening up a gap? I think yes. I think people are, are suspicious of, of, of their elected officials, they're suspicious of government, and actually museums can step in to say, actually, we're a platform, we're a place where these discussions can happen, they're a place where we can reflect on the history. I mean, immigration has been happening forever, um, and we can sort of take those stories that we know and kind of 
bring, and brings a new perspective to things and, and actually make people see things in a different way. And following up on that, one of the three strands at conference is people and places, so how identity is formed and reflected. So how, how is your museum changing its relationship with its users? How are you beginning to become a forum where people can come to explore these issues? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're trying to do is one of the things, being in a university, you can kind of say, okay, this is this you know, research that's kind of banal or people can't understand it, that type of thing. But UCL is being really, I think, innovative in terms of directing its research programs to the most critical problems that we have. So around sustainable cities, around intercultural interaction, around health and well-being. And what we're trying to do at UCL in terms of the museums is take that research and basically animate it, bring it alive, make people actually understand that the research being done is very useful for understanding these critical issues. And so we're doing a lot of exhibitions that are really trying to respond to um, relevant issues that are going on, as well as we're trying to think about um, our programs and how they can be platforms for people to have discussion and debate in different ways and different forms. So taking that, taking the forum that we have and, and sort of creating a platform for people to, to, to basically interact and engage. Gordon, do you think NMS are, are, are changing, shifting their relationship with their audience, kind of searching for relevance or searching to en enable other people to become more active participants in the, in the service you deliver? Well, I, I, think, I think every museum is on, on a journey of some sort, and we're we are, we are no different. And certainly in the past decade, we've put an increasing amount of emphasis in engaging with a whole range of different, different audien audiences, whether, whether it's community groups or specialist groups of one sort or another. And I think that has to happen. And, and I think, just mentioning Brexit, Brexit again, I think what we really need to do there is, those of us who are working internationally need to keep focusing on working internationally and not be dissuaded from that. And we also need to keep focusing on being inclusive and not let all the noise around Brexit dissuade us from that, because that's, that's how we can continue to have a, a voice and impact, is by focusing on communities, focusing on involving people in, in, in what we do. And Catherine, are you seeing that in your own service, that, that the, a shift towards engagement with community? Are you working in that way already? It's Again, I, I appreciate your... Yeah, I'm new. New? <laughs> new. <laughs> um, I think, uh, certainly I see within my own organisation, we've had a very clear political direction to uh, around tackling poverty, um, social exclusion, um, uh, disadvantage. And so um, a lot of programmes we've developed working with um, community groups, working with um, relative diff different um, communities, uh, also with different types of, of users. I suppose when I look at it, where I see the challenge is that we're not really funded properly to do that work. And so we do it where we can attract pots of money from different funding sources or different grants and so the challenge I think going forward is how do we actually embed that into what we do as an organisation and not just bolt it on when we can. And as somebody who's coming in, were you aware of that before? Do you think that's something we're good enough at, at talking about and promoting that we're doing or do you think it's something that we tell ourselves within the museum community but you know, were you surprised that your service was doing so much? Uh, yes, I'd say that probably was one of the, the big things that I maybe hadn't recognised properly before I came in. Obviously, I come from a tourism background, so that whole economic impact of what museums do, I very much understood. But the social impact, I, I just probably wasn't aware of. And that could be partly to do from the perspective that I came from. But I think there is a lot more we could be doing around communicating what we do, because that um, shows how we are more than just visitor attractions. Yeah, so advocating for the variety of things that you're offering. David. Two, uh, two issues. One is that we are fortunate in Scotland that, or not fortunate, but we voted to remain in Scotland en masse. Therefore, we continue to do what we were doing and, and, and working with the community and working in that way. Uh, and there's then the issue of those in the areas who voted against it, where you have a sector that was 97% for remain, now having to work with a community that voted for exit and how you balance that up and how you reflect that in the museum. So you have your people. And the second one is that through the whole Brexit process, there's been a, a, a almost bullying of expertise uh, and experts have been downvalued and we need to make sure as museums that we are the expert, we're knowledgeable, that we're leading, we try and shout for the expert across the whole sector uh, and derive that through and push that through and make sure we're seen as, as places that people can come for impartial uh, advice and support in the community and, and lead through in that in their community role. And are you acting, I see you have people building boats out in the exhibition hall, you're obviously actively participating in ensuring that your museum is a relevant part of the, the contemporary yeah, maritime that, history. Yeah, that, that's the way museums have gone. That's, the, that's what we do over the last five, 
10 years in Irvine, we've built that up. We've worked with the community, developed our community roots and, and focused in on that. And that isn't going to change. We're going to continue doing that. We're a maritime museum. We need an international perspective. The whole uh, ethos we're there is of building ships and travelling across the world. And we need to continue to that, tell that story, whether we're in or out of Europe, and work through that. Um, picking up on what something Tonya was saying about, about funding, obviously the MA this morning, David Fleming, um, I'm not sure if you were here during David's address, but he basically raised the fact that the Museums Association are going to try to start a dialogue about the lottery mm -hmm. and, and, and whether the lottery should continue to focus on large capital projects or whether we should look at the lottery focusing more on programming, learning, engagement, renewal of existing buildings. I made a quip earlier about National Museum Scotland <laughs> and have also worked on some of those projects. Um, <clears throat> what do you think? What do you think about the Lottery Fund, Gordon? How do, you, how do you think we should develop in our relationship with it? We, maybe we, I feel sometimes we're not, we haven't been as analytical as we might be about are we, are we using it to the best, of, best purpose, but we don't want it to replace revenue. So. No, I, I miss what David said. I was stuck in a train. But uh, uh, well, I, I, actually, I wouldn't actually agree with the premise, though. Uh, because, because, in fact, I think it's only about 13% of HLF's funds go to major capital projects. Uh, yeah, they, get, they get all the noise and all, all, the, all the attention. So, and, so, in fact, I would say in, in, in the time that Heritage Lottery Fund, certainly if we, stick, if we focus on HLF, has been in existence and haven't got one of the first grants awarded, I guess, my experience goes back a long way. Uh, I mean, HLF's moved quite a bit since it was, since it was, it was first set, set up, when there was a focus particularly on capital projects. But now, I mean, there's, there's a host of projects, community-focused projects, and of all sorts of different sizes, HLF fund now. So I actually think it's not actually correct to, to talk about focus on capital projects. Whether there could be more spread of, of, uh, of funding ac across the UK is something that pops up as well. But if you take Scotland, for example, Scotland's actually done better uh, per head of population than many other bits of the, bits of the, the UK. So that's not actually correct either, in, in, in fact. And I would also say that it strikes me, since, certainly since the new chair uh, took, took uh, up his post at HLF, there's definitely a shift, I think, in progress in the Heritage Lottery Fund to put more focus on, on uh, community-based projects, on more revenue rather than capital projects. And I think that's to be encouraged. However, uh, I, don't, I, I certainly wouldn't support the view that somehow the HLF should uh, stop capital projects and start filling revenue gaps that, just because government's cutting back. Anybody else have a comment I, on the lottery? I, I'd agree with that uh, mm -hmm. from the sector. I think there has been a shift in the HLF. I think uh, more projects are being funded with follow-on projects in education, community outreach and so on and so forth as part of the capital project uh, and making sure it's there. And I think that's the right way to go uh, to give those projects a success. New builds, again, it would be nice. Uh, it's not just new builds at the fund, but it's renovations, it's working in historic buildings and so on and so forth uh, that they develop. So it's not all just focused on uh, new builds and big capital projects. I, I think, sorry, I was just going to say, I think um, also HLF bring more than just money. They have huge experience and expertise, and I think they can add real value to projects. And we haven't had a major capital grant in Northern Ireland from HLF, so we would <laughs> like to be an exception if you're going to, if it's going to change. And Gordon's had more than his fair share, but uh, <laughs> more than his fair share. Um, but I, I, do, I do think that uh, HLF is, is such a valuable partner because it brings much more than funding. And I think it would be an awful shame not to have HLF supporting capital projects in the future. Uh -huh. I, I want to add something just about um, HLF and digital, because I think digital is really, really huge. And we've been, you know, I think everybody does sort of project-based digital projects. And we all, we, we all know that we re really need a robust kind of internal infrastructure in terms of workforce, being knowledgeable and being able to push forward digital projects and have the infrastructure necessary to share our collection, share our expertise digitally. And so I do welcome that the HLF is moving towards supporting digital projects as digital capital and digital infrastructure, because I think that's also very important. I'd like to move now to workforce, and I think one of the interesting things here is that we just, it, it, when you start listing all the potential issues that your workforce are facing, it's obviously a key challenge of, of museum leadership uh, in the current era, how you're dealing with staff who are, maybe have lack of permanency in their employment, they have uh, increasing workloads, there's a lack of diversity. Um, I was talking to a director at the coffee break who was saying it's, it's a question of do you replace the retiring curator or do you replace the, the, the person who comes in every morning and opens the shop in, in smaller museums. So I'd like you to tell, share with the group um, your current experience of workforce challenges and what are the really 
What are the pressing issues in your workforce, David? I think the issue of, of project staff and staff only having staff through projects and, and having them for a year, 18 months, two years, has certainly diluted the knowledge and expertise that we have across the sector. Uh, and industrial museums in particular, we've seen a massive change and, and, and a lot of the staff that we have, I think there's three now in my museum that are project funded and will be there for a, a range between a year and 18 months, use that knowledge and then disappear. And whether they disappear to other industrials are completely different uh, museums altogether. We've lost that knowledge and that skill base. We're fortunate to have a, a curator who's been with us for a long time and built that up. But that certainly is a big issue that, that there's a transient staff there that are generalists, that are very good, that they come in and do a great job, but they're not gaining that knowledge that would have been in the past of spending five, ten years working with a collection and knowing that collection thoroughly. Uh, there is also that issue of balancing what you do curatorial to what you do elsewhere and, and, and how you, you make sure that the museum's open, the museum's clean, you deal with visitors uh, and having that balance of, between those two can be quite difficult in smaller independent museums where it may be the same people that are doing both jobs uh, and how you cope with that. And then finally there's probably a big issue with the regard to succession planning and, and where the, the next people are coming from and the skills that they have and how we're feeding those through once we've got them in the organisation and, and training them and delivering them and working with them. And are these, so the, the workforce issue is a continuing and, and daily concern for you? I mean, is it, would you yeah. say it's one of your absolute... What's happening, who's yeah. where, smaller independent museums with small staff, uh, working out who's going to do what, where they're going to work in, where they're going to fit in, how you take on outreach, how community needs and so on and so forth, who picks that up, who deals with it, is it coming funded, all those questions are there all the time in smaller museums and independent museums. Tonya. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that, and I agree. I mean, there's an overall trend, I think, overall of, of, of kind of portfolio careers where people are doing bits and pieces of things, and some of that is self-driven. Some people want that, and we have to acknowledge that people want that, and I think we need to do more to change the way we operate and the way we work to allow people to do that. But at the same time, we don't want to become Ubers or Deliveroo's or those types of things where people have no security, um, have no, you know, sort of rights and those types of things. So I think there's a real challenge there. Um, about how we deal with that, and also in terms of the succession planning point, about the fact that we have more and more people who will not have traditional to careers to go through to get to those higher level roles. How do we make sure that people who are working part time or in project staff kind of are recognized for their value and um, can proceed up the, up, up the ladder? We've got to sort of change the way we think about those types of things. Um, the other thing I was going to say is diversity is obviously a huge um, issue that we have to deal with, and, and to a certain extent, I mean, I'm glad it's, you know, sort of in 2008 when I came into this sector, it was an issue, and then it kind of, with a recession, kind of went, went off the agenda, and now it's kind of back on the agenda, which I'm really happy about. But I think we have a really huge problem in this sector about it, and it, it's about the pipeline issue. It's about the fact that there's not enough people who are aspiring to be in museums from diverse backgrounds, and we've got to do a lot of work from the sort of early ages on, and we've got, had lots of um, programs around apprenticeships and that kind of thing. That's almost too late to a certain extent. Um, and I think that's a big issue we have to deal with. And I, was just, I just want to raise that I saw, uh, there's an article in the Harvard Business Review recently around diversity and about this whole idea of um, if, you have a, if, if you have a candidate pool of, say, four candidates who are going for an interview and one of them's a woman or one of them is an ethnic minority, there's actually zero chance that that person will get the job. Um, and that actually, if you were just to add one person from a, from a diverse background or a woman onto that it, recruitment pool, that person would have a 50% ch chance, higher chance of getting a job. So the pipeline issue for us is really, really huge because it's not just about having a few people. We really have to sort of go out there and get more um, diver people from diverse backgrounds in our, um, in our sector. And I say that as diverse as racial diversity, as American, and as having come from the corporate sector. So I'm just a bag of diversity. <laughs> <laughs> but in some ways you're saying that those things need to start, you know, almost with the first children's first encounter with yes. the museums. I mean, that's partly about every part of the service has to your, your interpretive yep. offer, your programming, everything has yep. to model. Yep. 
yeah. your, your approach to diversity. Yeah. Yeah. And we just have to, I think, be, be, be a bit more creative about the way that we approach things. You know, it's funny to think about when I was in consulting, working with engineering companies that were desperate to get women into engineering. And, you know, you do so many programs in schools about getting women to engineering. And actually what they found out was, actually, if we start to pay script writers to write television shows about en women engineers, more women want to be engineers. And so we have to sort of harness popular culture to a certain extent to get people excited about things, excited about wanting to do things and just be maneuver a bit. To, to so make I'm sure. thinking a reality TV series set around the UCL <laughs> Museum yes, collection. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can find some cracking plot lines for it. <laughs> so what are your workforce issues, Gordon? What are the things that are concerning you at the moment? You have your percentage of staff who are... Yep, well, that, that's one. I mean, I agree with David's points, as I said earlier as well, about the, the, the loss of expertise across the sector. And certainly something I think the Museum Association should be shouting more about, in fact, because that's a big issue down the line if we don't have people who actually know what our collections are and can actually do things with them. Uh, and again, diversity is another important area. But there's, there's, a, there's a further one that I, I think is perhaps under the radar a little bit. I mean, if we're in a sector that's changing and that we're, we're, we're all in some shape or form having cutbacks from funders, whether it's governments or local authorities or grants from local authority independent <coughs> museum, there's, there's, a, there's a need for, for all of us to secure funding elsewhere. Uh, and I, have, I must say, I, I read with despair some of the things I, I've seen in museums general in the past, the past year or so where, where I, I, you, you need to have an organization that's turning itself from a local authority into a trust and then somehow magically all this money is going to appear. Uh, and in fact, I think it's a real issue for the sector about how we develop more skills in, in uh, securing funds, whether it's from HLF or, or a trust or trying to get some local company to support, because that is a skill in, in itself. And I think with the changes taking place in the sector, uh, that's something that's going to become increasingly important and certainly something we are, we are thinking about because if our, as our grant from government has decreased in real, in real terms as well as in, 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 in cash terms to, to some extent, we too are having to focus on saying, well, how can we secure more income from a wider range of sources? And so we are actually looking at how we can actually support our staff in that uh, and share expertise amongst those who perhaps have got experience in that with those who don't. And is that going to come through to sponsorship? Is that going to be looking at different revenue I, I, streams? I, I think you? it's absolutely everything from, from commercial income to sponsorship to, to, to saying, right, can we get, who, which charitable trust can we obtain grants from? Is the, are there more and broader range of projects we can seek support from HLF or Big Lottery Fund or Arts Lottery Fund, etc. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's going to be an increasing challenge, I think, uh, to actually secure a broader base of funding. And then when BP arrive with their big fat check, you have the ethical issues as well in terms of who you, who you, whether you have the luxury of saying no to people who who arrive with funding as well, presumably? Well, uh, yeah, I, th I think any, any sponsorship always comes with ethical issues. I mean, uh, the sponsorships isn't a, I mean, it's not a donation, it, it's, a, it's a business transaction, so that there's, al there's always things one's expected to do for it. It's a question whether you want to accept it on that basis or not. So do you feel you've had to become more business-minded in your, in your museum director's career? I mean, do you well, I, say, I, I guess because I spent my first 20 years in the sector in the, in the independent world, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to think I started off that way, so, so, so to speak. Uh, but certainly, I think even my organisation, the time I've been there, has actually moved quite a, 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 long, a long way. Um, although I'm not sure many people get to the, the obsessive point I, I, I'm at, where on a Monday morning, uh, I, I obsessively look at the visitor figures over the weekend, which is, I think, what everyone here who's from an independent museum probably does, actually. I'm sure David does, actually, if he's not been working at the weekend, is that focus on, on, on the income and visitor numbers and what the shop's doing and so on. If you, those in the independent sector, it's part and parcel of what you have to focus on to keep going. And it would be fair to say that most of us assume that national museums are sitting in a nice, cosy bubble of secure funding that, where you're not actually monitoring those things quite as... I would say it's much larger sums of money, but it's not as simple as cos being cosy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's the first thing you do on a Monday morning, Tonya? <laughs> <laughs> Drink coffee. Drink coffee. <laughs> exactly. See what emergency has come up <laughs> over the weekend. <laughs> no, no, I think on the point of, um, about sponsorship, I think I, I just want to contribute that, that I think we're moving into an area where sponsorship is not as um, 
not as big as it once was, and we're actually moving into an area where actually organizations want to partner with us. Co corporations want to do more partnering, where you see the strategic synergies between the museum and the organization, and I think that helps to mitigate some of the issues around sp sponsorship, when you can see a sort of reciprocal relationship that's not just a transaction with money, but actually you have an organization that's kind of saying, we have a joint venture that actually, actually it would benefit us to partner with you, and, and you know, money is part of it, but that's not the whole thing. I say that because for us um, at, at UCL, we get a lot of corporations who want to partner with us for research, about research and innovation. And one of the projects we did was around 3D, development of 3D technologies, and we had a technology company that very much wanted to develop 3D scanners that were highly accurate for museum objects. Um, and we started a partnership with them, but basically the partnership was, we just need to use your objects to test our equipment. But what we did is we moved them and say, okay, if you're going to sell these scanners to museums across the UK and around the world, people, you've got to make the business case for why they would use them. Why do we need these, why do we need 3D objects? And we got them to actually then partner with us to start to think about what are the applications around 3D, all those types of things that have helped us engage our audiences and, and that relationship grew that way through a partnership of synergies around what each of, each of us needed. So museums are getting better at speaking up for what they need from yes, a, from a yeah, partnership. Yeah. So it's a true partnership, yeah, not just yeah. a, somebody opening the cupboard yeah. and letting them. Yeah. I think Tony makes a really important point because uh, we don't have a lot of big companies that hand out a lot of cash in Northern Ireland. So corporate sponsorship is not in that kind of much more business transactional way is has be, would not be something we would have benefited hugely from. But I think. From a sponsorship perspective, the opportunity is to develop relationships and partnerships that will last over the longer term. And I think um, it's a real opportunity, particularly for companies that might be wanting to look at their brand and reposition their brand. It's also an opportunity for us to look at the museum brand and what people think and perceive about museums and through sponsorship to do something that might be a bit more unpredictable or take a bit more risk or to really challenge people's um, perceptions um, of what a museum is, and so I think that's an opportunity that I would like to explore through corporate sponsorships in the future. And interestingly, I think brand is even a word that we have got more comfortable using because I think it's a word that previously in museums would, would set alarm bells ringing, I think, in some quarters because it, it implies a commercialisation as opposed to a clear articulation of a set of values and a and an organisational identity. I, I haven't asked you about workforce. I wondered what your workforce, workforce issues are. Again, you've come in with a fresh pair of eyes. It's usually the best time in some ways to see what's going on. I, I wouldn't disagree with what um, anyone said. When I look at my own um, specific museum, um, we've had 30% reduction in our revenue funding over the last five years. That's going to, not like, like everybody else, that's going to um, continue into the future. And I think to date, the focus has very much been on um, what can we cut and which posts can we lose. And those posts tend to be lost either through voluntary exit schemes or through um, uh, natural wastage because people retire. And so what happens is that you don't necessarily have the right people sitting in the right places doing the right jobs and you don't have more money. So how do you actually reorientate and get the right people doing the right things with the limited resource that you have and I think that's one of the big challenges. I think that's probably a key challenge isn't it when you lose staff in a kind of non-strategic way it's very uh, challenging. Uh, ab ab absolutely um, and particularly in, in you know for, for those that certainly in, in my organisation I mean in, in Scotland the Scottish government's got its policy no compulsory redundancies which is all very, all very well but when that, that's combined with cuts of grant you inevitably are forced into a, a situation where someone retires uh, and you, you, you end up not being able to re replace them because that just happens to be the post that's vacant. Uh, and so you, you're in danger of ending up with a bit of a patchwork quilt in terms of expertise rather than trying to reshape the organisation to fit in, with, fit in with the new reality. And I think that that same, that's, that same picture will be familiar with many people in local authorities as well, I'm sure. Yeah. And conscious in workforce, we, we haven't mentioned volunteers and we rely greatly on volunteers mm -hmm. and a lot of independent museums rely on volunteers and they need to be developed and worked through and supported and make sure we, we continue to have that support from them. And there's lots of museums wouldn't survive without that. But we've also experienced, and National Museums in Liverpool have the, the, made, made this point last year, was the problem is, is when, you, when you have cuts, you end up, for example, if you're running a big volunteer coordinate programme, you need a volunteer coordinator, you need a member of staff to enable the volunteers to train everybody properly, to keep everybody motivated, and there you have a chicken and egg situation. Again, it's a resourcing challenge. Is we need to pay for someone to coordinate the volunteers so that we can then have access to all that additional support. And we have, we're fortunate that we do that and we have that and we have 60, 70 volunteers that we work with. 
but there, there are museums out there that are solely volunteer and run in the yeah. independent sector that don't have that support and are trying to do that for themselves and there has to be a mechanism, there has to be a way that they can be supported, that they continue to be funded, that they're still there uh, and don't lose out just because everything's been cut from the top and following through. I would like to finish my questions on a slightly cheerier note, but I will be looking for questions from the floor um, in a minute, so if you could start thinking. Um, we were here last time for MA conference 10 years ago. Um, I was a... Uh... <laughs> 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 David's feeling old. <laughs> Um, I, at the time, was working for the BBC, and it was my first time back into the museum sector for... Uh, I'd had a bit of time off for good behaviour. Um, and I felt then that the museum sector was pretty inwardly focused. Um, and between then and now, I feel museums have come roaring out of the corner um, with more positive energy. I think sort of frustration has turned into re resilience, I think. Um, we've become more proactive. We'd, we're out there forming relationships with anybody and everybody who can help and support and partner with us. So if we meet again in 10 years in Glasgow, where do you want museums to be, Gordon? Um, well, I, well, hopefully even more out there, uh, actually. I, I think you're right about that change in the past 10 years. I think there has been a shift where, where museums have tried to engage more communities, try to tell people more about what they're doing, why, 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 why we exist. And I think that's a trend that will, will continue. But I think we will end up with a different museum landscape uh, in terms of governance and different types of uh, museums. And that's really a result of funding pressures. But hopefully stronger, Absolutely. more dynamic. Yeah. yeah. Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I would, I, would, I would agree with that. I think that's the way this, the sector seems to be going. And it'll be much more around shared ownership of our spaces and shared ownership of the collections and how we work together to put a, a you know, to generate content, to generate exhibitions. Um, and I think, I think the sector will move much more increasingly that way. I mean, potentially, I don't know, arguably, your own appointment is an interesting shift that we have in the National Museum in Northern Ireland director. Are you the... You know, help. From, <laughs> <laughs> from a... Not, not, from, not from a museum background, I mean, it's, you know, I think yeah. we're, we're getting better at drawing from different sector expertise, as Gordon was saying, in terms of diversifying funding, we're getting better at seeing you who else the, is out there. You can be the judge of that in 10 years. <laughs> Will you come back? Will you still be here? Well, who knows? <laughs> David, 10 years. 10 years ago, I was new in the, the, the sector and, and did think it was very much a, a closed shop. Uh, very introverted, looked very much in. I think it's got better. I think in some areas it's a lot better. In other areas it's still quite closed. Uh, my, one of the big concerns I have is all the local authorities moving to trusts and how that's going to impact over the next five to ten years and what's going to happen with them and that changing landscape. Uh, but I'd like to see a, a, a braver, more uh, risk-taking museum sector that, that's out there fighting its corner, uh, not always out there with cap in hand asking for money, but out there demanding uh, money because of what it delivers and what it can give to community society in the country. Tonya, 10 years? 10 years. Um, a museum sector that's much more responsive to contemporary issues, really, really good at drawing on the collections and the history that it knows um, to address contemporary issues. So I see it, I guess, coming back to your journalist background a little bit, you know, you've got most contemporary journalists are pushed to be pumping out information all the time without having the time to do that kind of long form journalism anymore. And I see museums being able to possibly fill that spot to provide people with deeper information about the things they're reading about on Huffington Post and refreshing every five minutes to to, to see, but actually provide that kind of broader view. Um, and so I hope that we move into a space where, where we can be much more responsive to what's going on. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right, punters, up to the mic. <laughs> Leaping from the chairs. <laughs> Don't all rush at once. <laughs> Come on, these lovely directors. Could you go to the microphone? Is that possible? I know everyone thinks they speak loudly, but there's right microphone, left, microphone two, three, and four. Yes, is that all right? The microphone, you have to go to the microphone, not the microphone come to you, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I'll be looking for somebody to follow Alistair Brown from the museum. So if you could say who you are, please. Uh, Alistair Brown from the Museums Association. Um, I feel like I'm doing stand-up over here. Um, uh, so um, it was mentioned this morning in uh, David's opening speech um, already, Ed, but uh, last week Ed Vasey, the former culture minister in England, uh, made a comment about uh, the fact that he, he thought that Museums were uh, that the museum sector was being uh, inward, inward looking, uh, um, 
fundamentally left-wing and wasn't and, and wasn't accepting certain realities about uh, about the funding of the sector. Um, this idea that no, saying that, that no museum should ever close. Um, and I wondered what kind of considered response you would give to that kind of idea. I know that he's the minister in England, but I think that those are, those thoughts are that would be the same no matter what uh, a skeptic or a critic was uh, was looking at the sector. And I wonder what uh, response you would give to that. How would you respond, so, Tonya? So that's the that response to the idea that we have to be more, um, we, we, we can't rely on government funding. Is that essentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would say, coming from an American point of view, so the American system is much more um, focused on private philanthropy. Um, and so that comes with its risks um, in terms of um, having to create programs and, and responding to corporate interest or personal interest in terms of development. So I, one of the things I really value about the UK and being in the UK is having organizations like Arts Council, government funding, that, that, that is much more considered in terms of using funding and thinking, directing funding to give access to the most number of people and not just focused on the biggest cities in, in, in the area or in the, in the country and things like that. So I, I, don't, I, I don't agree with that. I think what, we do have to be smarter about what we're doing, but I don't think we should be throwing out the system that we have. I think we have to secure that government funding, um, but then look for added, added, added um, funding on top of that. And I would just say also, too, about the whole uh, related to the issue of um, funding within London and moving it out of London and, and that, that type of thing. For me, it's, it's much more about identifying pockets of depri uh, depri you know, deprived areas that we have to focus on. And they could be. There are some areas in London that are, are like that. Um, and thinking about our institutions that have the most capability to fundraise outside of government funding. So our largest institutions, like you know, Royal Opera House or Tate or those who can actually draw in that kind of sponsorship or those types of things, putting maybe more responsibility on those larger organizations to free up more cash for the smaller organizations that are in less, um, you know, less well-to-do areas. Tonya? Catherine? And Catherine. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was Tonya speaking. Catherine. Catherine. Uh, I think as a principle, yes, we do have to become more um, self-sustainable. The challenge is how you get there and the speed with which you can get there. And I think there's an expectation you'll do that very fast. But I think uh, in the face of very dramatic redu reductions in funding, whereas actually government will almost need to support and facilitate that move towards self-sustainability, I think. Gordon? Well, I, I, I've just seen these comments by Ed Vesey, but uh, I, I would certainly say if, the, if that's his view of museums, it's perhaps fortunate he's no longer a minister. Um, be, be, because, I mean, I, I think that's, that's a caricature of the, of, of, of the sector, a most peculiar, peculiar one, uh, one at that. Uh, and it, it, particularly given the, the fact that if there's local authorities across, across, the, across England uh, talking about closing museums, it's a direct result of, of cutbacks in the, in, by the government that he was part of. Um, and so I think, I think the, the, the notion that all museums are somehow left-wing, whatever that might, might mean, uh, perhaps that means speaking up for communities, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's a caricature of, of the real world, actually, and it's a bit disappointing, in fact, actually. And perhaps means we need to redouble our efforts to, to communicate to, to, to government about the, the purpose and role and impact that museums can have. Maybe he's bringing his own issues to work, having lost his job. I think, I think Gordon's right. I think we need to look, it needs, he needs to look at the wider sector. You know, we're not just delivering museums, we're delivering regeneration, we're delivering health, we're delivering well-being, we're delivering all those things. And just to say you shouldn't fund museums because museums shouldn't be funded it's just seems silly. And it's a bit like looking at insular, of... looking at, He's looking at it in the way that he sees the, the, the industry and the industry's not like that anymore. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the challenge. It's actually being able to demonstrate the much wider impact um, that museums have. And Certainly, looking at our new programme for government, it's much more based around outcomes, and I think we can contribute to many of those. And I think museums haven't traditionally been seen as being able to do regeneration, social impact, you know, all of those various different things. So how do they actually recognise that in terms of supporting museums in the future? Do you think that's been a language shift in how you argue, you argue what you do in terms of we have shifted from to, towards social justice, towards health and well-being towards arguing that we're much more part of the wider cultural yeah certainly certainly we, we we've started to go into the area of health and well-being and explore that um and yeah i think i think all those social impacts that that we can have is something that we're starting to talk about much more because we used to talk about economic impact we used yeah. to talk about tourism impact and it's kind of we're just creating a, a much wider package of areas 
in which we believe we have impact. Uh, although I, I would although, say, although Lucy, actually, I, I mean, I, in the past 15 years, the sector, and including the MA in particular, has done a huge amount to communicate the impact, impact it has. And, you know, quite frankly, we actually don't need any more reports to demonstrate the impact of museums in a host of different areas whether it's the economic impact or whether it's health and well-being, as Mark O'Neill's done a lot of work in that and speaking later in the conference about it again. There's a vast amount of evidence that underlines all these points. The question is, how do we get government to listen to it mm -hmm. more effectively? Certainly judging by Ed Vesey's uh, comments. And I, I, w I would say that uh, I think you probably could distinguish, make a distinction between, say, the Scottish government's view on that uh, and, mm. and the Westminster government, where I think the Scottish government does actually say that. The, the Westminster government, I think, has sometimes said that, but then, then you wonder if they really believe it. Is that partly because we have had a lot of consistency in Scotland? We've had a lot of continuity with the same minister, and that the minister has the sort of tourism dimension to her role as well, and it's a... It's a well, she's only just, just got a tourism dimension. Yeah. Is it? We've only got continuity recently. In my first 10 years of my job, I had a different culture minister every single year. Right. Uh, so certainly, I, I think uh, there's certainly been uh, the benefits of stability with uh, Fiona Hislop, who's the current cabinet secretary, have been in post for quite some time, and that's been hugely beneficial to the sector as a whole because I think she understands the sector. The fact she's gained a, t gained a tourism brief, I think, I would certainly say is very positive because yeah. things can be more joined, joined up now. Uh, but I, I think there's a, there is a challenge, certainly, for those, those at the conference who are, who are uh, from south, south of the border, but how that message can get through to government in a more consistent way, and just judging by Mr. Vesey's comments. I always think it's partly interesting as well is that culture minister can also feel like a transition to something else. People are often putting cultural minister on their way up the tree, as it were, whereas I think in... Um, come on, another question from the floor. Yes, please. You've got two, brilliant. Or are you leaving? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, wouldn't like to embarrass you. If you could say who you are and where you work. You got to the mic first. You, oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. Hello, I'm Ros Croker. I work at the National Maritime Museum in London. Um, you talk very much about increasing the diversity of our workforce, which is something I feel very passionately about, and I'm championing in our museum. And one of the things I think is really key to achieve that is to make sure that a directive comes from the top, from yourselves as directors, and there's resource put behind that. Can you give some examples of how you're ensuring that's happening in your museums? So increasing the diversity of your workforce and how you're proactively engaging with that. Okay, could we have the other question as well? So we've got both of them in hand. Thank you. It's a completely different question. Um, uh, Edmund, South Edmund Southworth uh, from Mike's National Heritage, which is not in the EU, so Brexit... <laughs> <laughs> Brexit, Brexit makes it. Um, it's, it's following on from the previous discussion about transition and really wondering what the appetite is in the sector for managed transition from being here to not being here. Um, my, my grandfather was a linotype compositor for a newspaper. It's a job that no longer exists. Newspapers are different than they were. Most of them have closed down. Um, there are some museums that, quite frankly, we should close down, but we should do it in a managed and organized and disciplined way, in the same way that we put effort into creating new ones. And if we could demonstrate, I think, our uh, sensibility and rigor as a profession by accepting it is time for some organizations to move on either into trust status, if that is best for them, or their collections to be dissipated and rehoused professionally. And I am not talking about a bonfire or anything like that. I'm talking about professional decline. And I just wonder whether there's any appetite for that in the audience. Okay, thank you very much. Should I take the diversity? Yes, we'll take the diversity question first. So what are you doing to address, actively address the diversity of your workforce? Well, one of the things is in terms of recruit, recruitment. So um, one of the things that I actively do is find networks of diverse, um, that, that include diverse um, people in them and circulate job descriptions to them, quite proactively asking people. And there has been research on this also in other industries that actually seeking out 
different groups to apply for jobs ups the number of people who are applying for those kinds of jobs. So being very, very proactive about where you are advertising jobs, what you're doing in terms of recruitment. For me personally, it's about mentoring people in the, in the sector, so giving people the confidence that they can apply for, for certain jobs and giving them the language to use to, to be able to, and this is the language of museums and this is how you apply for a museum job. So personally, that's kind of my thing in, in terms of helping um, people and mentoring people. Um, at University College of London, we've gotten to, um, we, we have started to do um, uh, applications that don't have people's names on it. That, that might be common, but, but um, we no longer have names on, on applications, so that doesn't bias the, bias the process. So those are a couple of things. John. David, have you got examples of? We, as a small museum, are really out in the marketplace doing those things and then employing the best person for the job. Uh, and we just pure and simply going through that process, making sure we've got a, a, a diverse uh, interview panel, uh, interview list as we can, uh, and then going through the process, uh, and, and just taking the, the best people for the job and making sure that happens. There is an issue, I think, still in, in, in Scotland where if I turn up at a, a general museum uh, gathering, then it's probably 60, 40, 70, 30, female to male, yet if I turn up at a director's gathering or a senior management level, then it almost reverses uh, round the other way. Uh, and we're still not seeing the, the full potential of the female workforce coming through to the lead positions. Catherine. Um, okay, so I've only been there six months. <laughs> don't have lots of examples. Um, I, I mean, as well, I suppose from a recruitment perspective, you could will do everything you can to ensure that you have as wide a pool as possible but I do think always you should appoint the best person for the job as David says. I think an opportunity where we can look at um, embracing diversity more certainly within my own um, museum group is around volunteering so we don't have uh, huge numbers of volunteers but I think a volunteering strategy and a, a proper volunteering strategy can really help to bring diversity in and support your existing workforce not by replacing jobs but by adding value where we could be doing all sorts of things to support routes into employment and to build skills and and confidence and helping people in and, and embracing diversity in that way I think as being an opportunity where you don't have a, a huge amount of money to go out and radically change your work, workforce. Gordon. Obviously, I'd say, rather than repeat what everyone said, I think it's not just about recruiting, it's also about developing people as well. And so certainly in our case, we've had quite a number of people who've started off with us in the front of house team have ended up in other roles, so several curators, one of our learning officers, the person who manages all our learning and programs enabler team all start off in the front of the house team. So giving people opportunities and giving them some training, development and mentoring opportunities is really, is really important. And it, it's, so it's not just recruitment, it's just the start. Yeah. yeah. Can, I, can I just add something? And, and basically it's passing the buck to somebody else. But I do feel, coming from the United States where obviously we have a framework around affirmative action um, and you know, a model that hasn't been accepted here. But I do feel that there's probably a role for DCMS and government actors in being slightly more vigilant about monitoring numbers and asking questions about numbers. Um, that, that would be very helpful. I mean, at this point, I think my understanding is there's very little compiled data on, we don't even know how diverse the, the, the sector is because we don't, you know, that's not compiled in a very rigorous and, and, and publicized in, in a way that we have access to it. And so I think part of that is actually having DCMS kind of raise the profile of that by being more rigorous in their, in their monitoring and, and asking questions, being part of interview panels for the highest jobs, th those types of things. Yeah. And our second question was, I would paraphrase it as, are we brave enough to accept that some museums simply aren't, aren't going to cut it anymore and that we'd have to accept closures? You're smiling, Gordon. You get to answer first. <laughs> I must remember not to smile, actually. Um, <laughs> Well, actually, I can sympathise with Ed Southall's point because my, 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 my grandfather was also a linotype you know, type compositor, uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, something is, is the, and so was my brother until he lost his job through, through the, the industry disappearing. But yeah, I, I think that's a fair enough point, actually. I mean, I, if, if some museums are going to close, there, there is an issue about how, how that, that closure can be managed such that the collections are protected. Uh, and, and I think that that's certainly something that, that needs to be borne in mind. Are, are there some museums that... It, you know, they, they would, be a, would be a great loss? Probably not. Museums come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And to be quite honest, they've always come and gone to, 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 some, to some extent. I think what's happening now is much more, it's a much more widespread uh, 
closure or threat of threat of closure. Sometimes major institutions like the New Art Gallery Walsall, for example, is the most recent high-profile one uh, threat threatened with closure. Um, but I, I think it's certainly it's certainly worth worth uh, considering that point about is it something HLF should be hoping is, should be aiming as part of its resilience program to manage change, not just decline. Um, because far better off that collections in the hands of someone who can actually do something with them than in a store under a care and maintenance basis only. Catherine? That's not something I have very strong views on as yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the questions that I would have in, in my head is, um, you know, that I would ask myself as a national museum is what could we be doing to help support the, the local independent sector and how do we work differently or better together? Um, so not necessarily a case of museums closing, but how could we do something with relevant collections um, in a more meaningful way for audiences. So would you like the National Museum to support you more? Well, <laughs> as a museum that nearly closed in 1999, yeah. uh, 2002, 2004, 2000, uh, <laughs> uh, Gordon, Gordon did, did nearly uh, get our full collection anyway. Uh, really, the, my point would be that we need to be, uh, if we're going to save museums that are going to close, then they need to be looked at at an earlier stage and it doesn't become a knee-jerk uh, rush into action at the last minute try, with everybody trying to save it. And we need to be looking at how we either transform them into something that can be saved or make sure that the collection is then transferred in a, uh, a sensible and, and acceptable manner rather than everybody rushing at the last minute. And, and, and I think for that, the museums need to be more open about where they are with greater transparency, but identifying those at risk at an earlier stage and then working with them either to mitigate that, as happened in our case several times, or uh, go through that closure process in a, in a, in a well-orchestrated fashion rather than at the last minute in rushing. Tonya, what do you think, given your... Yeah. Last comment. Yeah. No, I just, I, I think as, as we think about ourselves being broader than museums and being in the sort of social sphere and, and sort of promoting health and well-being, I mean, we start to merge with other types of organizations in the social sphere. And so maybe we start to think about interesting collaborations or putting together collections with health organizations or those types of things. So I think it's about rationalizing and, and just thinking, yes, thinking not every museum needs to be saved, but what is the kind of value of that collection and where can we make sure that the value of that can continue on in maybe a different form. And on that note, I'd like to thank you, Tonya, David, Catherine, Gordon. Thank you ever so much for your time and insights. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.